Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today uh, to this really special event celebrating Mr. Howard Dudley's freedom and recent exoneration. Uh, on behalf of the Duke Law Innocence Project and former student in the Wrongful Convictions Clinic, it's great to see so many faces here um, that turned out for this event and to, to hear more about this incredible story. For some background, on March 2nd of this year, Judge Parsons down in Kinston, North Carolina, said that Mr. Dudley has known for almost 24 years that he knew what Mr. Dudley had known for 24 years, and that is that his lifetime conviction back in 1992 for molesting his daughter was an injustice. Judge Parsons vacated Mr. Dudley's conviction based on the motion for appropriate relief filed by the Wrongful Convictions Clinic here. The motion alleged violations of Mr. Dudley's rights by law enforcement, social workers, prosecutors, and his own defense attorney, and of course a claim of actual innocence based on the recantation of his daughter. But if you really want to know Howard, you need to hear what he said before the hearing. When asked if he regretted rejecting the plea deal offered to him almost 24 years ago that would have allowed him to avoid jail time altogether, he said he would still reject that plea deal even today. However, Howard said that everything that looks like freedom is not always free. I have peace of mind within myself. I have freedom behind the fence. I have freedom within me. Well, we're so lucky that he has this freedom here with us today to share his story with all of us. So now we're going to hear from Evan and Grady, two students from the clinic that will tell us about investigating Howard's case. Then we'll hear from Professor Newman and Jamie Lau of the clinic to hear about the hearing itself. And finally, and we would thank most importantly, from Mr. Dudley himself about the entire process, what that process has meant to him, and more importantly, what his free future holds. So thank you. Because you're Duke students, I know you figured out already, I'm not Evan and I'm not Grady. But, but I'm going to go first, uh, Professor's prerogative, just to disregard everything <laughs> we're told and just take over. Um, actually, I just thought it would be, I know you really want to get through the four of us and get to Howard quickly, so I just thought it would be helpful for you to have just a little bit, um, a little bit more information before moving on. I put the we put the dates at the top of this um, slide. This is Howard still incarcerated. The News and Observer, the Raleigh paper, did a, a long series, a four-part series on Howard's case back in 2005-06, and then came back when um, they knew that the hearing on uh, the basis of our motion for appropriate leave was imminent and talked to him again. And that's when he gave that very eloquent and um, heartfelt quote uh, to the paper about he still would reject the plea even after serving almost 24 years in prison um, because he was, he's free. He can look at himself in the mirror and know that um, he didn't do anything to his daughter and he was not about to admit to it. But we put the dates up there because I, I guess that some of you in the room um, are probably, may have been born after April 24th, um, 1992. And that means, if, that's, if I'm right about that, that means that your, your entire life, but since March 2nd, uh, 2016, uh, Howard was incarcerated. So for your, if you were born after that start date, um, up until March 2nd, 2016, Howard was in prison for something he didn't do. That's a tremendous number of birthdays and other holidays and sunrises and sunsets. And one of our other clients, I haven't talked to Howard about this, but one of our other clients who was released talked about finally being able to see the stars because you're inside at night. And um, so being just being able to things, the little things we take for granted. I know Howard is going to talk to you um, about that, what he's enjoying now that he's out 
But I also want, so I wanted to put that out. But I also want to tell you that, uh, and Grady and Evan will speak more to this, but what a remarkable team achievement all of these cases are. That for most of them start in our Innocence Project, which is the student organization that Chantal leads now. And I would re be remiss not introducing Shannon Welch, who just came, she didn't just come, she just returned, because she was probably taking care of something. But Shannon Welch, who's going to be the student director of the Innocence Project next year, and she, um, she helped, well, helped, she organized this event um, almost uh, entirely by herself, with the help of others, but I want to thank Shannon publicly um, for, for that. Um, but the other, so it's a huge student, um, you know, sort of effort behind these cases led by the lawyers, and I, James Coleman is, is seated over here eating. Uh, Jim Coleman is, what did I say? Jim Coleman, James. <laughs> I have no idea who he is. I thought his name was James Coleman. What did I know? Uh, Jamie, Jamie Coleman, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Coleman. Uh, Jim Coleman to my right, and of course Jamie Lau. We're the three lawyers, but I can assure you that we would not be able to have the success that we've been able to have in the clinic without the student work. I'm surprised I'm looking out and I'm seeing a lot of the students currently in the clinic or in the advanced clinic or just hangers on who, who never stop working on their cases. They're here and that shocks me because I thought they really worked on their cases 24 seven. So I'm, I'm glad they're taking a little bit of time for lunch. Um, we get these cases and we don't know if the people are, are innocent or not. We get them after they survive a very low level screening at a nonprofit that we established here in Durham, the North Carolina Center in Actual Innocence. That nonprofit just looks at is the person claiming innocence, is the person um, guilty of a felony, was that felony, was it a North Carolina crime, is that person, and have at least three years in the sentence, and that's, and then we get the case. So when we get the cases, we have to really start up from ground up reinvestigating. I'm not going to, I'm not sure what the next slide is, so I'll, well, that's Grady and Evan. Um, they will tell you a little bit about it, but this, we've had this case longer than we, we'd like to have cases, but they just take a terribly long time. We filed the motion for appropriate relief in this case. It means it's a massive document. It's about 80 pages long with about 200 pages of attachments and numbered paragraphs, so it'll drive you crazy. And we filed that in October 2013, and we never got the hearing until March 2016. So some of the delay, at least we tell ourselves, it was a delay caused by others, not by ourselves. And, but some of the delay is simply because we are a product, a project that runs, a clinic that runs by semesters, right? So we have 13 week chunks of time and then you leave us over the summer and we hire some people who try to keep the cases moving, um, but it just takes a long time. So when we finally are able to achieve justice for someone, it's, it's long, it's, you know, the saying, justice delayed is justice denied. Um, in our case, it's always delayed, unfortunately, and we like to believe there's a little bit of measure of justice that, that comes at the end, or at least freedom. That's all I'm going to say. Um, we're going to turn it over to Evan Grady, who are going to talk to you about, um, whoops, the other way, about um, student hearing prep. So, Evan and Grady. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start off and just, um, Broadly speaking, there were three claims. This is Grady. This is Grady Campion. <laughs> Evan to Grady's left. So when Evan and I started on the case in September of this past year, there had already been uh, maybe a dozen students that had worked on this case. And the motion for appropriate relief had already been filed. Um, so our job over the course of the year was to get ready for a hearing. Um, so in the motion, there were essentially three categories of um, arguments we made. Uh, the first is new evidence. Um, the only factual support for Howard's conviction was the allegation of his daughter, Amy Moore. After Howard was convicted about um, four months later, Amy Moore recanted that allegation. So um, that was central to our new evidence claim as well as uh, expert testimony from a psychologist and a psychiatrist um, that demonstrated what we now know about the susceptibility um, of children and specifically child interviewing practices. So um, our job over the course of the year was to line up um, witnesses uh, to, to testify at Howard's hearing about that. 
the second category of claims uh, were Brady claims. Uh, state that that is the prosecution failed to turn over um, to disclose exculpatory evidence. And the key document and the key person uh, for those claims was the guardian ad litem, who in 1992 was appointed to represent Howard's daughter, Amy Moore, and his job was to represent her best interests at the time. He was the only person in 1992 who actually investigated and looked critically uh, into her allegation. And his conclusion was that um, her allegation was false and it was impossible. Uh, that record was in the state's possession in 1992 and wasn't turned over to Howard's uh, lawyer. So unfortunately, we couldn't call Paul Porter to the stand because he passed away a few years ago. So we had to um, call the DSS worker at the time, Johnny Waller, to come to testify. And we were able to um, pull together the factual support for that claim through her. And the third claim uh, was ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, Howard's trial lawyer at the time had been practicing for about a year. He had never uh, tried a felony case before. And he put in a total of about 14 hours working on Howard's case. Um, so we called him to the stand and then we called um, uh, another attorney, uh, an expert, to testify to what ineffective assistance of counsel would have been um, in practicing in that area at that time in 1992. So um, that was the work we, we did to sort of pull together the factual support um, for the hearing. I just I thought there should have been a dramatic pause at 14 hours because you know how much uh, time you spend getting ready for class, right? Um, at least I think you spend a lot of time getting ready for class. Uh, or maybe that's a rumor. But I, um, so uh, just 14 hours um, for, with a client who is facing a life, facing and received a life sentence. So that's just, um, we knew we were onto something when we saw the billing records. Uh, so, I mean, I guess Grady already alluded to the fact that by the time we got on the case, it was already, uh, we already had an evidentiary hearing granted. So, all of our work was basically prepping for the hearing, uh, which mostly included going through all the documents that we had and trying to track down witnesses that we could potentially call at the hearing to support all of the claims that Grady just mentioned. Uh, so, to do this, this basically involved numerous trips out um, to Eastern North Carolina to try and track down various fact witnesses, um, both in Kinston and surrounding areas, um, as well as speaking with experts to testify regarding child memory um, and other things like that. Um, so really, you know, I, I think personally I joined the clinic because I wanted some, some real hands-on experience that is often elusive in law school. And so, I think we, we really got lucky that we hopped on to a case that was already heading for the evidentiary hearing. And so we really, basically all the work we did was hands-on, real interviewing um, and communicating with people, um, which was a really, really great opportunity. Um, it of course obviously ended in a successful outcome. Um, so I think we're both really glad that we, we got to experience this. Um, and it, it was a great experience. Talk about the hearing. Great, Jamie's going to talk about the hearing. Yeah, and I'm going to come up. Um, first, I don't know how far I'm supposed to go with this slideshow, so I'm just going to talk as long as I want, but not not too long because we want Howard. To, um, um, first of all, Grady and Evan, they're, they're being modest. Um, we were preparing for a hearing, and, and, and at the beginning of their semester in the fall, I said, we need these witnesses, and, and, and I knew that the fact witnesses we needed, because we had alleged that these folks had these facts material to the case in our filing. So, so I gave them a list of those folks. And then we had made arguments based on um, evolving social science research, and a lot of that was because a student sitting in a chair, similar to you, um, Cortland Tisdale, who was a <laughs> clinical psychologist before coming to law school, worked with us and helped us put together these lengthy arguments dealing with um, child interviewing techniques, how the social sciences change, how using anatomically correct dolls is not an ideal 
way in which to interview a child witness. So, so he had a really firm grasp of all this new social science research that supported the claims we were going to make. So it was all in our motion, but he had the firm grasp on all the social science research that we were alleging in our motion. We did not have a firm grasp on everything that we needed to allege. And of course, when we get to an evidentiary hearing, we're put to our proof. We have to show that this is, in fact, what the science shows today with respect to child witnesses. Um, so Evan and Grady received two placeholders, psychologist A and psychiatrist A, right? We needed two witnesses that, that we weren't sure. So they went out. They talked to these folks. They brought them in. Um, before I even met the individuals, they had had lengthy discussions with them. And, and then you know, sat down with them. And we went through, I mean, we didn't just choose the first person we sat down and spoke with, because we wanted to make sure that the person we put on the witness stand was going to be somebody that could um, speak in a manner that would be easily understood in court, um, and would go over well as a witness, and would handle uh, any questions on cross-examination. And they were the frontline workers um, on that cause. So it, it wouldn't have been, um, it was with their extensive help that we were prepared for the evidentiary hearing. Uh, I just want to make some brief comments about his case. That, that first of all, 14 hours, let it wash over you. Uh, that 14 hours is the most generous projection of hours we could, you know, we could look at his billing records and, and come up with. Um, it was actually uh, 12 hours is what he billed for his work pre-trial. So, so that's being generous when we say 14 hours. Um, but, but I also want to talk a little bit about the investigation in his case. Howard was sentenced to life in prison after an investigation by the Kingston Police Department that involved four interviews that totaled 45 minutes of time. Let that wash over you. The investigation in total in Howard's case was four interviews spanning 45 minutes. And based on those four interviews, Howard was arrested and charged with the crime. They never went to Howard's house. They never attempted to speak with Howard. Howard wanted to talk to anyone who would listen to him. The only time they tried to speak with Howard was after he was arrested. And when he was arrested, an attorney was appointed, and his attorney uh, told him not to speak with the police, which was, the, was right at the time. But it's possible that had they approached Howard, this could have all been resolved beforehand. Because the other thing that wasn't mentioned to you is that at the time the allegation arose, there was a support dispute between Howard and his daughter's mother, who he never married, um, and they didn't live together. They, they, their relationship had ended about eight years prior. Uh, but there was this support dispute ongoing. The police never asked any questions about the support dispute. Even in those four interviews that they conducted, there were red flags being raised all over the place. Um, one of those red flags was, um, though it wasn't reported, the officer told the DSS social worker that there's this ongoing child support dispute. Never reported that in the formal report, the, the, the memorization of the 45 minutes of interviews, that's nowhere to be found, but we found that in DSS records. So they were aware that there was this ongoing dispute between the parents, but they never followed up on that. Um, they said in the DSS records, this was all material that we found later, in the DSS records, the investigator that interviewed Howard's um, daughter, Amy Moore, and, and her mother, Diane Moore, noted to DSS, the girl, she, she wasn't upset at all. Um, she was with her mom when they came to the police department. They didn't come to the police department till what appears to be the next day after the allegation um, first arose, according to them. And then that the mom told the entire story. They never really heard the story through the daughter. It was all told by the mom, who, of course, is in this dispute with the father. And they were doing court two weeks later um, on that dispute allegation. So, so Dr. Sally Johnson, forensic psychiatrist, was our psychiatrist at hearing. Thank you. If, if you can take forensic um, psychiatry in the law. Which, which I took when I was a student with Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson. Um, so, so, of course... At the end of this hearing, we put up, we put up eight witnesses. And, and I should tell you, Howard testified himself. Um, it was 
entertaining to us because at the time we called Howard to testify, the state stood up and they said, Your Honor, I just want to uh, put on the record that we exchanged witness lists and Howard wasn't on their witness list. So at this point in time, I'm not sure about the propriety of him testifying here today. Um, and of course, uh, we had, when, when the judge said we needed to exchange witness lists, he, he had reserved the right for us to make lap. 11th hour's decisions at the time. He said explicitly that we could. And we weren't sure we were going to call Howard, but we thought it was important. Um, not because it supported in our claims. I can tell you we would have won whether Howard testified or not. But Howard wanted to get up on the stand. He wanted to testify and he wanted to tell the court um, that he didn't commit these crimes. Uh, that he would never admit to something he didn't do, which is why he stayed in jail for an additional 10 years from the time in which he was given the possibility of parole. If you don't have any understanding of the system, um, at the time Howard was sentenced, he was sentenced to life, but he had the opportunity for parole um, after I believe it was 15 years of his sentence. But to get parole, he had to um, participate in a program um, it's not the DART program. Howard, do you know the name of the program? It's escaped me right oh, oh. The SOAR program. He had to, the sex offender, sex abuse rehabilitation program. To get parole after that period of time, you have to participate in that program. Howard was not going to participate in that program because part of that program is you have to acknowledge, um, you have to acknowledge that you committed the crime and express remorse. That's what they're looking for. Um, and then they're trying to rehabilitate you because you've, Express that you've committed the crime. So he had the opportunity to participate in that program, but he said, I'm not going to do it. So Howard wanted to get up and testify because Howard wanted everybody to know that should the court um, not vacate his conviction, if he had to go back to prison after the hearing, he wanted his opportunity to tell anybody that he was at peace with that. He would not admit to a crime that he didn't commit, regardless of the carrot that was dangled in front of him to admit to that crime. And he wanted that to be known, and he wanted that to be known publicly. So what choice did we have? Um, after presenting the evidence, after arguing to the court, it's, it's a mini trial. I mean, we have opening statements, we have closing statements. Um, I just want to give one quick anecdote before we play a video and turn it over to Howard. Um, we, we knew the judge wanted to make a decision. We didn't know which way it was going to go, but we knew the judge wanted to make a decision from the bench because we, Howard got done testifying. And it was about 11.30 in the morning uh, when Howard was off the stand. He was the last witness we called. And the judge looks at the state and he said, evidence, we, we said, you know, uh, Mr. Dugley rests his case. And then they turn to the state and they say, any evidence for the state? And the state stands up and says, uh, no, Your Honor, the state has elected not to present any evidence. And, and in these hearings, it's the opposite of, the, of a trial. The burden is on us, so we have to prove to the court um, that we've met the standards for relief, um, and then the state can just say that they don't want to present evidence because we've failed to meet that burden. So that's what they elected to do. And the judge takes a look at us and he says, um, counsel, 10 minutes give you enough time to collect thoughts for closing arguments? <laughs> Um, we knew that he wanted arguments over with so he could make a decision. Um, the state stood up and they said, Your Honor, it's 1130 now. Uh, we'd appreciate uh, the lunch hour to collect our, our, our thoughts prior to giving closing. Um, I said I was fine with 10 minutes, which, whichever amount of time. And he looked at the state and he said, you got 20. So, so, so 20 minutes later, we're arguing why Howard's conviction should be vacated. The state is arguing nothing to see here. Um, but all that said, immediately following, the other thing you should know, we're giving these arguments, and as we're giving the arguments, the courtroom's filling. And it's not filling with other spectators coming from outside, it's filling with additional deputies. And the elected clerk makes their first appearance in the courtroom. Um, so during that 20 minutes, the judge summons the, the, the courthouse um, administrators and said, I'm going to make a decision from the bench in this case, so you get whoever you need to get over here um, before I make that decision. So as we're doing these closings, um, court officials are, are filing into the courtroom 
And um, it, it, deputies were actually flanking the judge, which was kind of interesting. Uh, not a good sign, by the way, because you think if they need additional deputies, it's not going to go your way. Um, so, so we didn't know what to make of that, but that was taking place during the course of closing. And then here's the end of the hearing. By a commercial. We do not endorse whatever product may be <laughs> part of this commercial. Spain, we're home. I know, but this food is so delicious. And those authentic ingredients and easy recipes from the Kroger Taste of Spain event have me cooking in a Spanish state of mind. It's like a Spaincation. Head to Kroger for authentic recipes, specially it imported foods, like and that. delicious yeah. meal ideas at the Taste of Spain event. Great food, low prices at Kroger. For So I know you guys don't want to hear from me anymore. With that, I give you Mr. Howard Dudley. Please welcome him to Duke Law School. Hello, Duke Law School. Thank God for each of you. Ms. Newman, uh, Jamie, and the law team here at Duke University, I say thank you. As I sit there and look at those moments, uh, it was very emotional. And I'm going to try to get through this. Uh, that was hard. Uh, come from a family of nine or uh, four brothers. Five sisters. Uh, my mom and dad taught us to do the right things. Uh, uh, don't go out, hang around the wrong people, get in trouble. And uh, I'm the only one out of ten children to ever set foot inside of a prison. And I, I knew that my mom and dad gave us good advice. Uh, uh, there was times when I hung out with the wrong peoples. But there was a time when I knew how to draw the line and uh, separate myself from them. Could have been in trouble, could have sold dope, could have been on dope. But those wasn't the morals that was instilled within me. And uh, not saying that I did everything right. I made some bad choices. I don't want to say mistakes. I made bad choices. There's a difference. And I made some bad choices. And those bad choices got me into a some trouble, but not the type of trouble that I wasn't able to handle. It, it was nothing that led to prison, but uh, they was things that got me in trouble with young ladies. And so, um, and which led to my daughter Amy being born, in which I was in prison 24 years for. Amy and uh, her mother, we, we was uh, never on good terms. Uh, uh, when Amy, when she got pregnant with our daughter Amy, I was very excited, and when uh, Amy was born, uh, I wanted to always develop a relationship with her, so there was no problem. But the problem came about when I met my wife, and we got married. That's when trouble started. And so, as being a man that uh, come up in a strict home and was taught right, I took care of my responsibility. And my responsibility was to take care of my child. But I wanted to move on with my life. 
Uh, at the time when these charges were brought upon me, I was, I was doing good. I was living, I was taking care of my daughter Amy, doing everything that was asked of me. And uh, I had worked on the two or three jobs where they closed up, so I wanted to go back to school and uh, to study criminal justice. And so my life appeared to be good. You know, I was doing, take care of my responsibility, and I, and I wanted to, to live a normal life, a good life. So I wanted to take care of my children. And uh, I, I noticed that uh, the relationship between uh, uh, Amy's mother and I began to go sour. And uh, don't understand why, you know, and, but uh, I, you know, pretty much uh, know that it was the fact that I have gotten married on her. I think some point in time she thought that we were going to get back together. And because that didn't work out, uh, I come home from school one day getting prepared to go to work. And they, uh, the lady called me from social service and wanted to speak to me. And I had no reason, I had no idea what she wanted to talk to me about. And so when I arrived to her office, and uh, she called me in the back, and she said, uh, do you know Amy Moore? I said, yeah, that's my daughter. And, uh, well, anyhow, her mother have, have come down here, and she had taken out papers on you for child molestation. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that. I would come up in a home. I, I, would, I read up in a home that was moral. Morals were taught. Values were taught. And so, anyhow, uh, I was told... Uh, that uh, Amy would be taken to ECU to be examined. And uh, she told me, said, uh, when Amy, the test results come back and they're negative, well, you don't have anything to worry about. And so I didn't really trouble me that much at that point because I knew that I hadn't committed any type of acts on my daughter. So when the test results come back, came back, uh, they never got up with me to let me know the results of the test. All I know that I was called into my lawyer's office, and he said that these, he had, he said that I have taken care of these charges. So he said, um, "You go ahead on with your life. This has been taken care of." And so now my life is back to normal. Until about three days later, he appeared at my door and he said that um, the state has decided to pick up these charges. And then I said, "What charges?" And uh, he turned around. He walked off. Never said nothing else. So he said, I'd be in, well, he, well, he told me he'd be in contact. And so um, now I'm thinking that something has taken place somewhere because I'm thinking that they have discovered something that has happened to my uh, eight-year-old daughter. And uh, I soon learned later that nothing happened to her. Nothing happened to her. And everything that was surrounding me, these charges, everything was bogus. Everything was bogus. It appeared to me that uh, that uh, 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 that not having been in any type of trouble, so I was I didn't really have a, a grasp of the whole picture about the law system. So my my lawyer came and talked to me, and uh, he discussed things with me. And so the day we went to trial, and uh, I was I was looking for the man, the one person that could really help me, which was the child protective uh, person who had come out and did an investigation. And I noticed that he was nowhere to be seen. And so I began to ask my lawyer concerning him. And I never really got an answer to why he wasn't there to testify on my behalf because he was the only one that I had talked to other than uh, the lady at social service. And so uh, I never saw him again. He never showed up at my trial. He was never subpoenaed. And he was the one that had gathered the information. The next time I heard that he had uh, tried to intervene this case from going to court, and I, I did not get this information from him. And uh, he talked to my family. But he said that they decided to go against his better judgment. And so I'm in court with the only person that could really help me, with the only person that could really shared a story of the investigation because he soon learned that uh, Amy, my daughter, had been coerced. Uh, the, uh, the problem was the fact that uh, it wasn't Amy, it was Amy's mother, and I just didn't get along. And this was like a revenge thing that she was using. And uh, so in, in, in court, uh, they uh, uh, proceeded, and uh, 
at some point in time during the trial, Mr. Harvey looked at me and said, this is not going well for you. Well, I, say, I said, well, what do they have on me? I, I wanted to know what am I doing here? What do they have on me? I said, I don't have a criminal record. There's no evidence. I said, everything that they have, from what I can see, is that Amy made a statement which was false, and the only person that could have spoken on my behalf to prove to this that it was false, he's nowhere to be seen. And so, shortly after the trial was over, and uh, I was back in the back, I, I, I knew that at this point that I would be found guilty because he pretty much, my lawyer pretty much told me that. And so in the back, he asked me, uh, spoke to me about a plea bargain. I said, well, what is a plea bargain? I said, I don't know anything about a plea bargain because I've never been in trouble. Well, he said that you was confessing to the crime or left the charge. I sat and I pondered this thing. These are serious charges. These are serious charges. And as I pondered it, I couldn't, just couldn't do it. I, I learned a long time ago that you make choices that you can live with. When you get up in the morning time, you can look at yourself in the mirror and be proud of yourself. And I told Mr. Harvey that uh, I would go to prison. I told him that I would go to prison before I admitted to committing any type of sexual acts on my eight-year-old daughter. And uh, he told me, he said, uh, the judge wants you to take a plea bargain because he believes in your innocence. I began to listen at what he was saying and weighing what I had to live with for the rest of my life. And I said, I will go to prison, which I did. Gave me a life sentence plus three years. And obvious, obviously I was angry. I was angry at the system. I was angry with my lawyer. I was angry with Amy. I was angry. With I was very angry. And I think I had a right to be angry. And so I said to myself, I got to function. Only thing that I had to fight with was truth. And I wasn't about to get that up. I knew that there ever be a, come a day when I walk out of prison system a free man again, it would have to be truth, through the truth, in which that's what got me free. Amy's mother, uh, she was uh, she was very hurt. She had a right to be. I wasn't a good boyfriend. As a matter of fact, I was a bad boyfriend. But that was between her and I. I saw no reason for her to bring my daughter Amy into the picture. I was doing what the system asked me to do, take care of Amy. I did these type of things. But it wasn't until I got married that the allegations came out. And I talked to my wife. I had a, a son who was just born, um, Adrian. He was uh, about a few weeks old. He wasn't that old. And I had a two-year-old son. And I had just landed a new job. I was working at uh, KNC making tow motors. A very coveted job. And if had I not come to prison, I would have been thinking about retiring right about this time. And so, you know, <laughs> it was difficult. In prison, you, you was around, you, you was put into an environment that you was not used to. I was not used to being around criminals because I'd never been one. People ask me all the time, why didn't you take the plea bargain? Because I wanted to live. I wanted to live. I wanted to function. And I, I made a statement in the newspaper, everything that looked like freedom is not freedom. From the day I entered prison to the time I walked out a free man, I could go to the mirror every day. I could look at myself. And I, could know, I, I knew that this is what caused me to be able to live with myself because I had inner peace not out of peace because the prison walls is not going to teach you anything if you don't want to learn anything. But, you know, and I had to function. I had to function. I shed many tears. I wanted to be home with my family. I lost my wife. I lost my mom. I lost a lot of relatives. 
I lost a lot of friends that passed away. And, you know, I had to deal with myself. I had to deal with anger. I didn't have to deal with peace because I had peace. I had to deal with myself. I had to deal with myself. And that was the hardest part when dealing with the self and the environment, the environment that I was in. Uh, you around uh, in a place where all you hear about is crimes. All you hear about is selling drugs. I never sold no drugs, never been on drugs. You, hear, you get to hear this stuff all day. You learn how to function inside the prison system. And, you know, and, uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But I had to live with myself. And that's the only way I could live with myself, with peace, peace of mind. I hate it. I, I did hate. And, uh, you know, but I didn't hate to the point where I wanted to retaliate in any type of way uh, because that's not in my nature. That's not the way my mom and dad raised us, our 10 children. But uh, I had to find, I had to forgive Diane. I had to forgive Amy. I had to forgive. That was my only type of healing. That's the only healing that I had was to forgive. If anybody had think that you can forgive and feel whole hatred within you, it doesn't work that way. That's all in water. They don't, they don't mix. And uh, I got a chance to uh, talk to Amy. She, she came to see me. And the one thing she told me that I never forgot, she said, Dad, I'm in a worse prison than you are. And I knew she was. I knew she was. And her mother cried many days. She had no idea the seriousness of this crime. She had no idea the seriousness of this crime that she went in and lied about. She had no, she had no idea that how serious this was. And she suffered. She hurt. I watched her cry. One, this thing to get overturned, but it doesn't, someone said it doesn't work that way. When you found guilty, you go through the process, and someone said it take years, and it took years. And, uh, but I, I sat down one day in about 1995, I went to the chapel, and I got some cars, and I sat down, and I took those cars, and I wrote every young lady that I had hurt and asked them to forgive me. Out of all those letters I sent out, there was quite a few, <laughs> only one wrote me back and said, how would I forgive you? It's, to me, it's about maintaining peace with yourself. It's about maintaining whatever it takes. You know that you can live with yourself day, regardless of you was in prison or outside, but you need to learn how to function. You need to learn how to function. And the only way that you can function, you got to have peace. And that's what kept me. Uh, the SOARS program, I had no idea what a SOARS program was. Well, I had no idea. I do know that I was told that this will help you to go through the system, you know. But I did not know that you stand before a group of people say, I'm Howard Dudley and I'm a child molester. I had no idea that's what it was until I asked questions. And I said, oh, no, I can't do that. I said, no. And I turned it down. I turned it down because I knew I wasn't a child molester. I, I, told, I said, I can't go to the program. So about uh, a year later, they offered it to me again. And I said, no, my mind haven't changed. I said, I will stay in prison the rest of my life before I could confess to molesting my eight-year-old daughter. My daughter and I had a great relationship. We ran. We played in the dirt. We did everything. She spent weekends with me. We had a great relationship. It wasn't that bad. We, we, was, we was the best. And I love my daughter. And I still love her today, but she just won't. She, she's just having problems with making connection with me. So I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to leave until... Uh, she had my phone number. When, when the time is right, she'll call me. She'll call me, but I, I just wanted to let her know I appreciate what she did when she came forth and uh, she told the truth. She told the truth, and uh, I, I'm just thankful. I thank uh, Miss Newman, uh, the team of lawyers, and Jamie. So many wonderful people. I, I had a phobia for, for lawyers. I was angry. <laughs> You know, I, I, I really didn't think there was any good ones. I, I, I didn't. You know, I, I told, I told Miss Newman, I, I said, I really appreciate you. You know, uh, it, it was, uh, 
it was good because she she made me feel uh, uh, that uh, how you don't have to feel this way about lawyers anymore. She uh, through the situation I had been I had been I had had so many letdowns when we were setting in this last time, but right before I was uh, set free, I, I sat there. I had had so many letdowns. I said to myself, I didn't tell her, but I said, Oh, not another one. I said, not another one. And, and uh, that's why I looked so tense, because I had so many faith, everything that, and I said, he is overwhelming. No, they don't have anything to link me to child molestation. I said, why, you know, those are questions I had. I read a story one time in prison. I, you know, you grab the newspaper, you can go to the room and read it. When you get through, you bring it back out. So I, I read this story of this, this man who had uh, been accused of child molestation. It was during the time of the O.J. Simpson trial. And I was reading the newspaper, and he was in the same situation that I was in. And I understand the heaviness of this situation, these charges. I understand. So normally he would get up and go to church on Sunday morning with his wife uh, and his daughter and his child by, the, by another, another young lady. And so she noticed that he began to have problems. Notice that he didn't no longer want to go to church. He never no longer wanted to be a part of the family anymore. He began to distance himself from the family. So his wife recognized the heaviness of this situation. So I could relate to what he was going through. And uh, so this particular morning, he got up and uh, uh, took his wife to church and his daughter. And he came back home. And uh, he got a, a pencil and a piece of paper and he wrote his wife a letter. And he stated on the letter... I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. In order for me to win this case, I would have to have lawyers like O.J. Simpson have. He went in the shower with his 38, took his life, shot himself in the shower through the head. I'm here to say that the enemy tried to get me to do the same thing. Only thing different to me, I'm a Christian. I prayed a lot. I get up. I get up every morning. Around 4.30, I spend my time in prayer, read my Bible. Even though I was mad with God, I never gave up on praying because he knew my heart. I get up every, every morning I would get up, I spend time in prayer and reading the Bible. That's how I survived. But I'm going to say this right here. There was a time when I was so low, I thought that suicide was the only way out. You know, like I said, only thing that kept me, only thing that stopped me probably from doing it is the fact that... Uh, I, I talked to God a lot, my relationship with God. Uh, it was hard. It was very hard. But any situation that you're going through, you've you got to learn what brings comfort to you. You've you got to learn how to maintain your sanity. And I learned how to maintain my sanity through prayer and reading of my Bible. I was called a child molester. Those are some ugly names in prison. But you know what? I could still get up in the morning time and function because I know who I am. I knew what I had did, and that was the only thing that kept me. Had I plea bargained out, there's no way I could have lived with myself. There is no way. That's all. That, that, that is, I, I feel sorry for guys in prison who plea bargained out, and, that, and I met some. I met some that were just as innocent as I were, but they plea bargained. They have walked up to me and said, How, I wish I hadn't have done it. You got to live with yourself now. You got to live with yourself. The day I walked out of that courtroom, I experienced something that I thought would never get there. When I walked outside of that prison, no, let me back up. When they turned them cameras on me, when that judge looked at me, and he said, the system have failed you, Mr. Dudley, I saw daylight. I began to see a ray of daylight. I didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but I knew uh, I was doing pretty good at that point. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I looked at Miss Newman. I saw a smile. I looked at Jamie. I saw a smile. Then I started smiling. And he hadn't even been converted at that point in time. And, you know, I can never say enough for what Duke Law School had produced. And Miss Newman, Jamie... And all the students, I don't even know all of them names, but I hope to meet them again one day. I tell you, I tell you, uh, they are great. And, and my hope and prayer is that all you who's going to law school, all you who's 
or studying law, that you maintain the same type of integrity that Miss Newman, Jamie, and all these guys, and all those students that I have met. You know, what you do here is great. And I see a product. I had a chance to spend days and days with the product of Duke Law School, which is Miss Newman, Jamie, and all the students. And you know what? And I get a chance to talk with some of those guys I left behind in prison. I'm going to say, you have no idea the type of people up there at Duke Law School that believe in your innocence. I say, I, will, I'm, I intend to tell them that they are fighting for you. You don't see them, but I got a chance to look at them in the face, and I see fight in them. I see fight in all of them. And I say, man, just don't lose hope. If you don't lose hope, many things can happen good for you if you don't lose hope. And I just want to say in my closing, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do, everything that you're going to do. I thank, thank God for Miss Newman, Jamie, and all the law students that helped me to get my freedom back restored. There's never nothing good when you accept the lie. But when you got truth on your side, you have hope. Thank you. It is not hard to believe. It's impossible to believe that he is not a public speaker. Uh, we have never, um, you will know when you have a client, when they speak for the first time, you're a little bit on the edge of your seat. You know, so you're going to say, I really hate these guys. You know, uh, they, they took so long. That was just so beautiful. And as I, we just spent um, the weekend with Howard, Jamie and I did at the Innocence Network Conference in San Antonio. And so we spent a lot of time with him on the outside for the first time. And he, um, he speaks from the heart. I mean, I have never actually heard a person speak such say such profound things that have come directly from the heart. Um, we may have time for a question, but we do have time for photos. Uh, we wanted, this is the iconic photo. This is the one that the News and Observer had on its, uh, above the fold on its first page when Howard was released. What you don't know is that Howard took off his jacket and his hat that was prison issued and threw them on the ground inside, uh, inside the jail. I, as and my friend Liz back there knows, I follow rules. I picked them up. I said, we, we probably need to return these. Um, <laughs> we haven't. Um, so, and then um, there's the team photo. Howard wanted to go to... Um, Bojangles, because he had read about Bojangles and heard they had the best chicken. So that huge Dudley family and we, about 35 of us, took over a Bojangles in Kinston. And tech-savvy Jamie at the end of Jamie Lau um, tweeted the photo off to Bojangles headquarters, and they gave Howard a $100 gift card to Bojangles. And as his brother Elmer said, that's a whole lot of chicken. So that, <laughs> That's a lot of chicken, and that is that is the team. We didn't. If you ever have, if you see Grady and Evan in the hallway, please. We're running out of time, but please talk to them about the emotional experience it was for all of us to be there with the judge speaking such um, welcome uh, thoughts or saying such welcome things from from the bench. We knew when, if you know it, a Brady violation when he said the very first claim, the most egregious, even outrageous Brady violation, we knew somebody was going home with us. So, But we did a clean sweep. We won all of the claims, and as he said, the justice failed. But then... Um, yeah, so there's the whole group, or actually this is, I don't know if the whole group, but this is a group of us at Bojangles. But then we wanted you to see if anybody recognizes who he's, we're in San Antonio with Coach, I now know, Coach Pop. Who's Coach Pop? I don't know. But <laughs> there's Howard, who's a San Antonio Spurs fan, meeting Coach Pop this weekend and getting this great photo. And this little short guy between Coach Pop and, and Howard is not somebody Howard really, now he knows, but that's Barry Sheck, who really started with Peter Neufeld, started the whole innocence movement, as they call it. And then just at the, with the, the great um, uh, assist, not assistance, he arranged the whole thing, uh, Jim, I now know he goes by Jim, who knew? Um, <laughs> the great Jim Coleman over here on my right, we just got back from 
from the tower next to Cameron, where Howard, believe it or not, since 1973, has been a huge Duke basketball fan. And check this out. He's there with all these uh, great guys, Nate and Grayson. Look, see how I'm doing. And Nolan <laughs> and, and John Shire. So, yay. So I got it right. So this is this so, is what we just did today. So so I just want to interrupt because Howard, I, we've been taking pictures of him, and he's been harassing us. Jamie, I need those pictures. Nobody at home is going to believe that all these things are happening. Jamie, I need those pictures. So he doesn't know how quickly we work at Duke Law School. I have here a picture of Howard with Grayson, Nolan, John, and Nate James for him to take home today. So, so they will believe you in Kingston now, Howard. Um, now he's really for me. It took us way too long to get him out of prison. We had a photo of the basketball player. I, I think Howard would stay around to um, answer some questions if you guys want to come down and, and maybe ask him a couple questions for a few minutes. But I think we're out of time. But thank you all for coming. And once again, welcome, welcome Howard home.